From the VC perspective, we hear a lot of different entrepreneur pitches talking about being in the cloud, and I think that cl that, that overall topic has been somewhat bastardized. That overall the, the overall word of cloud is being bastardized, but there actually really are interesting startups that are coming up with viable business models and monetizing on those platforms. And so, uh, without further ado, I want to turn it over to Peter. Peter has a really interesting background. He's I think you know you've been involved with various types of MIT forums in the past. That's correct. Pe Peter is also an MIT alumnus and has a really interesting background from a technology perspective as a journalist and now as director of platform research at Salesforce, who's a real innovator in the space. I'm not just going to be talking about the Salesforce.com vision of the cloud because what's much more important is to understand that the cloud has now become a very diverse marketplace with many people providing fundamentally different services. And it's easy to get overwhelmed by the list of the technologies that go into that. You will hear people say, oh, cloud computing is virtualization. Oh, cloud computing is doing this on the internet. And I'm, I hope I'm going to debunk that and, and get you to see a very small list of very fundamental economic benefits that the cloud label should entail. If someone's going to say that what they're doing is cloud as opposed to just outsourcing or as opposed to time sharing or you know, whatever. And I want to start with a story. Late last year, there was a real oh heck moment at an agency whose name we all know because they were absolutely positively required to undertake a major project during the year 2010. It's in the Constitution that they absolutely have to do this every 10 years. And they need to spin up a rather large temporary labor force to go knock on doors and get information from people who didn't mail in the simple form. And the database wasn't going to be ready. And this is sort of like you know, a Y2K, only it comes every 10 years. The deadline was simply not flexible. And they had to do something. And so they went not to plan B, because they didn't really have a plan B. They went to plan, huh? And six weeks later, they had built the database. And six weeks after that, they had the application up and running to manage a temporary labor force of 170,000 people working for 2,200 partner companies all over the country. And I mean all over the country. And they will use this app for probably about 18 months. And then they will shut it down. And it won't cost them anything after that. And if you remember nothing else about this label of the cloud, it should mean the ability to respond on a ridiculously short time scale to a ridiculously volatile workload to get something done and when you're done doing it to stop paying for it and if you can't achieve those goals then i'm sorry i don't think you've gotten the point of of what the label of the cloud should represent because it's fundamentally about that ability to respond and to align cost with value, to do things and scale them up if they work, and kill them without mercy and without continuing cost if they don't. And with that said, let's, let's get into the details. Now, I said I wanted to really stress the idea that the cloud is a multi-product, multi-vendor uh, marketplace. There are a lot of things you can do that I will, without um, um, argument, qualify as cloud computing. Amazon will spin you up virtual servers, what they call VMIs, virtual machine images. Every one of them behaves just like a Xeon white box server, and you fill it with your desired stack of an operating system and middleware and so on. And this is really cool because you can scale at an amazing rate. There's a classic case, um, a, a little company called Animoto that does music videos to order. They did a viral marketing campaign on Facebook, and over a period of 72 hours, their demand went from 50 servers to 3,500. They would later say that with literally all the money in the world, you could not purchase, install, configure, and activate more than 3,000 servers over a long weekend. Just not doable. But because they were using virtual servers, they could simply say, we need more. Remember, remember the, 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 uh, the big brawl scene in, uh, I think it was the, the third Matrix movie, and Agent Smith keeps saying, more. Well, you know, same, same thing, only this is with servers instead of people in sunglasses. Now, there are issues with this model. It is a utility model, except that it's sort of like waking up in the morning and calling the water company and saying, I'm going to be taking my shower in five minutes, spin up another pump. 
it's better than having to buy the pump and install and operate the pump, but you need to do explicit capacity management in this model. And so you do create some new complexity to go with those new economies. So make sure you, you know, keep that, that whole picture in mind. Over at the other end of the spectrum is what we had the luxury of doing from a clean sheet of paper about uh, 12 years ago. We said we're not going to expose anything that looks like virtual servers. We're just going to expose APIs. Our model is turn the tap open more and get more water. You don't call us and say, I need more capacity. You just get it. And so all of our focus is on the APIs that handle things like content management and workflows and things. I'll go into that in a little more detail. But the point is, all of these things I'm going to maintain have distinguishing characteristics that make them cloud computing as opposed to merely outsourcing. I'll elaborate on that in a moment. Now, the other big player, of course, that's just come in uh, is Microsoft with Windows Azure. So the question is, well, where do they fit? I think they fit more over here than over here because it's still essentially an attempt to offer something that .NET developers will recognize. It uses the same tools, many of the same languages and um, uh, facilities like SQL Server um, in a model that they're saying is going to be, is going to be more scalable. Um, it's obviously still a nascent offering. They, they just brought out SharePoint 2010, which has a big online component, which does not run on Azure because Azure is still you know, not, not even in, in full production release. So obviously something big is going to be happening in that space, and I mean literally big. You can see these data centers from space. The, the, the one that's under the approach path going into O'Hare is the principal consumer of the output of a nuclear power plant. I mean, they're, they're investing immense amounts of capital in the capacity for this, and they have to because their model is lots and lots and lots of copies of the Windows operating system. You know, they're running in a virtual environment, but they, they have to do an awful lot of duplicates of the same code because that's the model that they're, that they're trying to scale. You will notice that even as they talk about the familiarity of things like SQL Azure, which is the SQL Server database model running in the Azure environment, they are also talking about new stuff, a new Azure storage model, which bears an amazing resemblance to what Amazon and Google are already doing. So you can tell they're, they're trying to boil the frog slowly and, and move their existing ecosystem into a world where you don't own a resource unless you're actually using the resource, which really changes the way you write your applications. You don't have you know, the registry as a scratch pad. You don't have lots of things that you always had in the PC model, where when you turned it off, things didn't go away. This is kind of like when you turn off a PC, somebody else borrows it for a while. It's a, it's a more stateless kind of model. All right, if things this different can all be cloudy, then is Larry Ellison right and the label of cloud means absolutely nothing? There's probably some evidence that Larry is wrong because his own people begin all of their vendor you know, trade show presentations now by essentially disavowing crazy Larry in the attic and saying, no, really, we are in the cloud. Larry's very entertaining, but. So what is the cloud? There's a whimsical little rule among programmers, it's in the New Hacker's Dictionary, called the 0-1 infinity rule, which is that in any properly designed system, you never see any other number. There's zero of something because any of it would be bad, or there's exactly one of something because you don't want inconsistency or redundancy, or there's an unlimited number of something because if there's no good reason for it to be zero or one, there's no good reason for any other arbitrary number at all. There's no reason why you should be limited. And I thought, this is an interesting set of numbers to apply to the cloud, because zero is your goal for on-premise infrastructure. Almost nobody really wants to own a server. Almost nobody. OK, we, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, there's a small number of people whose business is running big server farms. Most companies don't really want to do it. Acquisition costs should be near, near zero. Adoption costs should be near zero. We're, out, we're approaching these goals asymptotically. And you can see it in consumer hardware, because three years ago, People bought great big honking 17-inch laptops. Some of these things had liquid cooling, OK? The only growth segment in PCs for the last two years has been netbook class machines, which are basically smile on a treasure cap. They're a screen, a keyboard, a Wi-Fi transceiver, and enough battery to, to make the thing work. And people are saying, why do I want to carry this around? Intel used to put lots of money into VC investments in bandwidth and processor sucking applications like games and video editing. And that, that was how you sold people on the next round of CPUs, by making them think they really wanted to produce a movie in their home. 
and, that, and, that, and then they would buy a $500 processor uh, wrapped up in a $3,000 PC. And now they're saying, wait a minute, this is a flip. You know, this is a flip cam. I push the button, I get the video, I stick it into the USB jack, and it's on YouTube five minutes later. This is, this is what people are saying now. Why do I want to carry around all those resources? Why do I want to do all that work when Animoto will spare me from a half day of working with iMovie and produce that music video for my niece for her wedding or whatever? So that's the zero. What's the one? One is that when you plug in, it always works. There's one thing, and it's always working. Now, that might seem like a very low bar to jump over. But if you look at the way that IT has been done for a long time, even if you bought all your stuff from just one company, different pieces were on different release cycles. The client piece, the tools piece, the, the, the server piece, they all come out at different times, and everything, everything works quite right. And when something new comes out, you do a lot of backward movement to do regression testing and things. And a lot of stuff gets broken all the time. And in a cloud app, that should not be the case. When you log in today, it should work just as well as it worked yesterday, ideally better. You should not have the burden of installing or testing an upgrade. You should not be required to buy new hardware to run the upgrade. You should not need to install additional hundreds of terabytes of storage because the ERP vendor moved to Unicode for the databases to cite an actual example from fall of uh, 08. Um, and that's the one. Now, given the zero and the one, and a lot of people get this right away. They say, okay, yeah, consumer web apps do this. The infinity surprises them. The infinity is not just scalability. We've talked about scalability. What people are very surprised to discover is that you can have this and still have this. You can still have the ability to integrate the services with other resources, with other services, and with stuff that you own and operate yourself. You can still have customizability and programmability, even though the code base is being shared. And that sounds like a contradiction. And I'm going to, I hope, make clear how it is possible to do that. Because what that means for the entrepreneur, what that means for the, the, the startup and for the enterprise, is that you can have the advantages of all the economies while still having competitive advantage and proprietary um, value creating business processes. So. Here you are. You're a developer, and you're saying, how do I get me some of this cloud stuff? There's lots of different ways to do it. Since some of the models are essentially just, here's a virtual box populated with any code you want, well, the logical thing to do if you're a startup is to say, hey, I'm going to package my software in such a way that it just goes right into the cloud. You don't have to do any work at all. I'm going to, instead of having it designed to you know, go on a CD and pop into a slot and install itself on a Windows machine, I'm going to package it so it installs itself in an Amazon virtual machine. This is what Alfresco did. They have an open source um, content management uh, application, which they, which they sell to people who then customize it to add value for specific industries or to, to build a, a, a proprietary system for a particular company. And what they've done is package it as an Amazon Elastic Compute Cloud EC2, um, an EC2 ready stack. And it just drops right in. And there's a developer kit. And their goal is to help you develop, deploy, and monetize a cloud content application. They've taken care of everything that has to do with making it work in the cloud. All you have to worry about now is, what value do I add? Maybe I'm going to put in specific content, because that's the expertise I'm bringing to the marketplace. Maybe I'm going to put in customized processes to meet with the needs of someone who's doing clinical trials. Or maybe I'm going to do something that customizes it for law office practice, whatever. The only thing I need to do is stuff that adds value to that foundation. Another way to do this is to say, let's look at things that the cloud doesn't quite do yet. For example, when Azure was first rolled out, it didn't support the uh, very popular web scripting language, PHP. And so an outfit called Real Dolman worked with Microsoft to build a layer that fit in between PHP stuff and Azure stuff to make it look like it was running PHP. And so this is another way that someone can get paid for what they know. If you were the world's leading expert on PHP, you probably had an opportunity to package that expertise in a form that made PHP apps work really, really well on the Azure platform early on. So that's another way that you can take what you know, take your intellectual capital, and turn it into an opportunity for advantage in the cloud. So what are the value propositions for the developer? Well, there's the old code and new clouds. 
you can look for a way to take code that people already know how to write, um, Java code, .NET code, whatever, and deploy that into a scalable environment. So if you know how to do uh, Linux, Apache, MySQL, Python, Perl, PHP, you know, open source stuff, you can run that in Amazon Virtual Service very readily. And I believe you're going to hear from Aprenda tonight. Is it here now? Yeah, I'm sorry. You're, you're right there. Um, you're going to be talking about how your whole um, stock and trade is, here's an environment which your .NET app becomes a cloud app, right? Do I have that? Yeah. that that's, that's the napkin version of, yeah. the, of the mission statement, right? OK. So you're going to hear about that in more detail. Or you can move to the other side of the chart and look for what we do, highly leveraged code. Um, we have our own programming language. It's a Java family language. Uh, looks so much like Java that some people think it's a dialect of Java, but we built it from the bottom up so it would guarantee database integrity and a few other things. And it's governed by the environment. And if you build your app with that language, it runs in our environment and gets some nice guarantees as a result. That's our model. You don't need to make a mutually exclusive choice between these two models. That's incredibly important to understand. If you've got stuff that's already been written, and works great in Java or .NET or whatever, or you want to preserve maximum freedom to use new code in future environments, you think it's going to last for a long time and maybe even last longer than we or Microsoft do, fine. Go ahead and write it in something like Java and run that in something like Amazon. Um, people like Boomi and Informatica will help you tie these things together. And you will be able to say, let's see, I'm going to buy my storage and my bulk scientific and high performance computing uh, capacity over here in Amazon space. And I'm going to buy some analytic graphics that I really like from Google and wrap a collaboration environment built on Google Docs around my app. Use force.com so that I can deliver a version of this very quickly to handhelds and deliver it into internationalized environments. And then build this thing in such a way that you can drop it into your Facebook page and get a viral community going around your protein folding calculations. Work with me. It could happen. It could happen. And critically, it's not just about the one big cloud with all of these variegated services available in it. It's also about the fact that you can tie this together with your SAP and Oracle resources. You can go out and mine the dark matter of your universe that's out there in your Word documents and your PowerPoint files. You can use the services of people like you know, the Informaticas and Boomies of the world to tie this stuff together. And if you know that you're going to be working with a composite architecture for the indefinite future, fine. Go ahead and write some custom code to tie these things together. Custom code's not a bad thing. It should just be used only when you really need it. I have seen situations in which a relatively simple database query was replaced by 10 lines of Java code at a factor of 100 speed up as a result, because that one query was being run again and again and again and again and again. It was just dumb to parse that puppy as a SQL expression every single time. They realized, you know what? We should just hard code that thing. 100 times speed up. So by all means, use code when it's appropriate. Now, here's the thing that, as I said, really surprises people. You can have this enormous shared code base. We've got 80,000 organizations, you know, 2 million individuals using that code base. And we can do upgrades three times a year. And everything that's special to you, your user interface, your data, all that's just in one little pocket, along with the other 80,000 pockets of metadata that make each customer organization's view of that shared code quite unique, quite differentiated. Here's the thing that startles the heck out of people, is that custom logic can also be represented as a variety of metadata with, with acceptable performance. This is kind of like the, the, the shock when people realized, oh my gosh, I don't need to write uh, everything in machine code. I can write stuff as a .NET assembly and still get acceptable performance. You get to move up that abstraction ladder, and you get tremendous results uh, from that. So what can you do as a result? I have seen someone who never had touched our system before, ever, under purely verbal instruction. Someone saying, OK, now you see that menu there? Click on that. Yeah, you see that option there? Click on that. OK, check those three boxes. That kind of instruction. Build an application that initiated an approval process, escalated the request for approval based on an Active Directory lookup, sent the request out by email, parsed the email reply looking for the word approved 
in the reply, and if it saw it, moved the process on to its next stage. Pretty nice stuff. Constructed by someone who did not know how to write code, who had never seen this environment before in 20 minutes. That's the kind of leverage I'm talking about. And so things like building the content management capability, building workflow rules into the system, um, building query optimization in there so that you don't do <coughs> database query optimization anymore. You don't do index structure maintenance anymore. All of these things now become platform properties. Um, some of you may have heard that in the last uh, couple of weeks, we've announced our largest acquisition to date. We bought Jigsaw, which is a crowdsourced um, data quality maintenance community, uh, which will still have an open API, will still be an accessible resource for other uh, systems, but it's going to be very highly integrated into our system so that if you have a system that works with data that's volatile, like where people work and what they do, data quality maintenance will now essentially be a built-in property of your applications. Um, I've talked about Java. As of later this year, we will be in full preview on a capability we've jointly developed with the M-Force that will let you simply run standard Java written with the Spring Framework in our multi-tenant environment without any changes. Um, I don't have all, enough time really to go into the depths of the developer offering, and I don't think this is really a developer-heavy crowd, so I'm going to go ahead and, and, and skip past this one. Um, this is also pretty much developer-oriented, the visual tools for process uh, uh, definition. The, the whole emphasis I want to bring here is that this provably increases development productivity. We have four actually completely separate studies. I've only summarized three of them here that were done by completely separate teams with completely different populations of developers. All of them agree within one decimal place that you'll get a five-fold acceleration of the development effort because you're not writing as much code as you had to write before. You're not testing as many things as you had to test before. Things just fit together better. I'm particularly proud of this one because Galarith's only product is software cost uh, estimation tools. That's what they do for a living. And so when BAE PLC, the uh, systems integrator in the UK, wanted to pitch the FAA on writing applications on a cloud platform, the FAA said, well, we use the Galarith tools to run those projects. Can, are those calibrated for this, like they are for .NET or Java? And BAE said, well, no. And the FAA said, well, darn, that's just a real shame, isn't it? BAE got the message and spent 20 months and their own money to get Galarith to go out and do the field research to calibrate their cost estimation tools. So now you check the force.com box instead of the Java or .NET box. And they came up with this result, that you would cut your development effort by 80% by using these facilities. So what happens? What happens is that you've got a company like Animators at Law. They do litigation graphics. I didn't know that was an industry until I ran across this case study. But um, all those great things that expert witnesses do, there are people who, you know, they're professionals producing those great uh, demos for the jury. And they thought, you know, OK, this is a nice business, but what if we tied it together through LinkedIn with LinkedIn's knowledge of the legal community and who works with who on what cases, and Google News feeds on relevant stories involving things like big class action suits, pull the whole thing together, turn it into a software as a service offering called Law Prospector, bring it to market under their name, and all of a sudden now, they're a software as a service provider without owning a single server because the whole thing is running in our environment, and LinkedIn's environment, and Google's environment. And what they've contributed is their own distinctive expertise and their branding. And that's all they've had to do. Not a lot of capital on the line, not even any added development staff. Tremendous opportunity to monetize intellectual capital that they already had, but couldn't have really been able to get over the activation barrier to bring to market as a software as a service offering if they'd had to build their own provision infrastructure to do that. This and the census story are, are the two examples I really want you to remember. You can get stuff done and you can make tons of money that you would never have been able to afford to pursue before because of the enormous barrier to entry and now the barrier to entry is pretty much non-existent. Um, now here's the other thing that we're doing this year that's really exciting. Lots of people want what Facebook or Twitter or other social media can bring to your company. But they are rightfully worried. Anyone see the New York Times story with the graph of all the Facebook privacy settings? 
1,300 different possible choices you can make, buried in you know, 20 or 30 different places in the Facebook architecture. They want to have intrinsic security. If you start with a system that's designed to share by default and try to configure it for security, it's easy to screw up. We thought, what if we started with the other approach? What if we started with our existing data model with extremely precise and granular management of privilege and added real-time feeds and other social networking mechanisms to that data and trust model? That's what we've done in something called Chatter, which is currently in a, in a broad private beta and will be in general availability this year. We are using it internally. Our email volume is down by more than 40% because people now are getting stuff done in an environment that looks a lot like Facebook, but with the intrinsic security that if I don't have visibility of the data, then I don't have visibility of the update to the data. And I don't just follow people. I follow an account. I follow a case. I follow a spreadsheet. And if it changes, I get a message saying, this thing has just changed. And it shifts the whole environment into one of real-time, proactive awareness of what the heck is happening so that I can solve problems while they're tiny. It's incredibly exciting. Now here's the other thing that I've mentioned is the announcement that we made uh, at the end of last month with VMware. We've always understood that it was a fundamental issue for developers if we said, look, we've got a great programming language, but it's not the one you already know. The syntax looks just like Java, but no, in fact, you can't use your existing Java libraries. We knew we had to solve that problem, and so we've announced with VMware a major joint initiative to take the Spring framework combined with standard Java and the vCloud, which is VMware's big contribution. So now simply by dragging the icon of your application to the VMforce icon, instead of dragging it to the icon representing the server in your basement, you have just deployed that Java app into a fully scalable, highly available, highly secured, enterprise cloud environment. That's straightforward. We've already demoed this. It already works. Now we just have to get it up to full capacity before we turn on the, the broad developer preview later this year. And so force.com developers can use their existing Java code. That's good. Java developers can use all this other stuff that I've just described that will make the rest of their application five times as quick to build. And CIOs can say, oh, good. It's running standard stuff. I'm not betting the farm on this new proprietary stuff. So here's the new architecture of what we're talking about. The cloud infrastructure that just runs, the VMforce layer that will let you use existing resources if you have them and want them, the force.com layer that lets you do stuff like analytics and content management, and then this new chatter framework that lets you immediately add social network capability to your existing stuff. How important is this to the entrepreneur? If at any time during the three years that we've been offering the Force.com platform, you had brought a product to market on that platform, as of later this year, your product will now have social networking capability built into it. And you won't have to write another line of code to make that happen. It will simply manifest itself as a new feature of your application. Your apps become more valuable every time something happens down in that big red box that makes the shared code base more powerful. So that's what I wanted to share with you. This is where we see venture capitalists, entrepreneurs, and enterprise developers looking for the opportunity to work with a trusted service provider instead of building their own infrastructure from scratch, have low cost of entry, which means low cost of experimentation, faster time to market, which means first mover advantage means something again, and a high level of assured interoperability. And I'm really, really happy with, with the two people following me on the program tonight because they are going to speak directly to these same strengths. You're not just going to be hearing it from me, that you can work with trusted providers who will give you high uptime and a you know, rigorous record of reliability, which is crucial because people feel like they're giving up control when they adopt this model. And you can get high levels of interoperability um, with other services. That's also crucial because no one wants to rip and replace. No one wants to duplicate. And I think I should shut up and let them talk. Thank you. I just want to turn it over to uh, Sinclair at a friend, and I'll just briefly mention that we first, I believe, met Sinclair over a year and a half ago. And we think the overall area that he's focusing on, uh, which is the idea of helping other ISPs deliver applications through software as a service, is a very, very compelling one. And one of the things that really got us excited about Sinclair, besides the really strong value proposition of his company, is he's a real, uh, he's a perfect blend of technical acumen and business understanding of what are the drivers of why people need to move into 
assassin in the cloud, and um, I will let uh, actually I'll let Sinclair start um, just his uh, presentation, followed by Boomi. As uh, Somak mentioned, I come from a pretty interesting background. I'm a technical guy at heart. I have degrees in math and computer science, and I'll get into that in a little while. Um, but my entire focus in life has been software as a service from an engineering point of view. So I come with a lot of war stories from the front line, building software as a service applications, knowing what's involved, and getting a good feel for the effort that's required. And uh, the talk today is going to be focused predominantly on this new concept of cloud middleware. What we do at Apprenda is that we evangelize the idea that software as a service companies or would-be software as a service companies shouldn't be doing things on their own when it comes to building complex architectures. They should be leveraging middleware, they should be leveraging cloud technologies, and we fit in that bucket as an interesting breed. We're not a service provider, we don't have hosted offerings in the cloud, but rather we're a layer, very traditional uh, kind of middleware layer that you can license and run anywhere you want. I think the, the best way to set context is to think about it from the point of view of the software as a service provider. So when you think of a SaaS company, right, somebody who is delivering software in the cloud, what the typical model is, is you build business software, you deploy it somewhere, get it online, it doesn't matter where right now, and your customers are going to access it through a web browser. It's not going to be a situation where they're installing the bits locally and you know, dealing with the server setup and all that stuff. But instead, they're worrying about how do I get the application in the cloud and how do I get my potentially tens of thousands of customers to access it and use that software. So what does it mean to be a SaaS vendor? This is probably fundamentally the most important definition from our perspective when you're moving to the cloud. If you're a software company, you want to become a SaaS vendor, what does that mean? First and foremost, you used to be a software company. That means you had packaged software, you sold it, and you delivered bits. It was either through a CD, through a download, or what have you. Now what you're talking about is being a service provider. Uh, service provider, you have to take quite literally. All of our customers are now service providers. And when we say that, we mean think Comcast, think Time Warner, think anybody who offers a utility. The business model, the DNA, is very different than when you're a packaged software company, completely different. Enough that what you start needing is a variety of new tools, right? Uh, you're worrying about billing. How do you turn off service if somebody hasn't paid you at the end of the month? If you're charging for things transactionally, how do you meter and track those transactions so you can bill for it appropriately? You have a great website and you have self-provisioning and somebody wants to come in and say, hey, here's a credit card, I want access to the software. Well, how do they do that? How do you turn a customer on? All of a sudden, the switch from software company to service provider introduced all this baggage, all of these tools that you have to have in place if you're going to be effective in this space. The next thing that changed are your scale requirements. Uh, when you said your application was scalable as a packaged software company, what you really meant is that it scaled as much as your biggest customer needed. Okay? Now when you're a services company, all of your customers come to you. So it has to scale as much as all of your customer capacity requirements have. Right? Your biggest customer included, plus the next four, plus everybody else. So the scale factor of what your software needs to scale to is very different. It's no longer about the biggest customer, but rather all of the customers. And here's the key financial one, the economic model piece. Everybody who's familiar with software as a service knows that it's recurring revenue to some extent. You're charging for transactions. You're charging for time periods, maybe as in the Salesforce model, you know, some sort of per month charge, something to that effect. What the key thing is that it's no more 100% gross margins. When you were selling packaged software, it didn't cost you anything to replicate bits. You know, we can argue about whether the bandwidth on the download cost you anything. You're probably charging twenty or thirty thousand dollars for the license, so really, it didn't cost you anything. You walked away with hundred percent of your revenue in a fashion where you can allocate it toward the operating expenses of the company. That's it. When you become a service provider, cost of goods sold is now magically introduced into your income statement. You look at it, and you have revenue, and then all of this stuff got thrown out. Why? Where'd it go? It went to servers. It went to staff. It went to bandwidth. It went to all of the things required to actually produce something that people can pay you for. So the revenue line now got really small because you're not charging a whole bunch of money and you're paying money to get money which you've never been accustomed to and you can throw that out. So uh, you know, is it 40% of your revenue that you're spending? Is it 10%? Is it 15%? And what, what distinguishes somebody who's in the 40% category versus 15% category? And keeping it low is ultra critical. So that's what we're going to get into. And I think what we're going to do in the next slide is we'll zoom in to that specific question. One of the big cost components in uh, delivering software as a service is your effectiveness of delivery. So I'm going to ask a question that has a completely obvious answer. 5,000 customers, do you want to deliver that service to 5,000 customers across 625 servers or 90? Right? 90 servers sounds a lot better. We're talking about a big difference there. Uh, well, what's the difference? How do you get scenarios where sometimes it's 90 servers to satisfy 5,000 customers versus 625? What I want to do is choose two real-world examples that embody two different scenarios that put things at the opposite end of the spectrums here. The next slide is a prospect we had come to us uh, earlier in the year. Their, their software company, arguably their software as a service, uh, they've been hosting software for a while. We'll, I don't want to get into the debate as to whether that's SaaS or not right now. Um, but what they came to us with was this interesting profile. 150 customers, 2,000 end users across 50 servers. They had a three-to-one customer density, three customers per server. 
that's a pretty critical number when you think about that density because that's what's going to dictate how many servers you're going to need as you grow and that's going to dictate how much you're going to spend in collecting that revenue. You know, that this is the 40% versus 15% mark. Terrible COGS profile. They spent so much money on this infrastructure, even only at 50 servers, to offer it between IT staff, between the fact the footprint was pretty big relative to that, and they had complete lack of operational agility. So they got worried and they said, geez, what happens when we move to 300 customers? What about 600? What about 1,200? 2,000? These numbers, these ratios start to break down at that level. So they're at one end of the spectrum where we have red here for a good reason, not a healthy situation. <laughs> the next one is actually Peter's company, Salesforce.com. I think, Peter, you might have blogged about this in March of last year, right around there, where they released some numbers, uh, I think during some sort of event, where they had 55,000 customers, 1.5 million end users across 1,000 servers. <coughs> And even more interesting in this scenario is that supposedly out of those thousand servers, half were mirrors, meaning half were doing operational work. Right. And we look at that, that's really 55 to 1 density with this number, 110 to 1 density with that number. So great COGS profile, top-notch operational agility. How do we get such drastically, starkly different scenarios, right? 3 to 1 versus 110 to 1. What was the factor here? If anybody asks that question, then all of a sudden you start thinking about the real problems with respect to moving to software as a service. The fundamental difference is that Salesforce was purpose built for SaaS delivery, right? The folks that we were talking to were not. They were built in a traditional on-premises model and they were replicating. They would go through and say, here's the application. It's, it has nothing to do with SaaS, but I'm going to host it in the cloud on EC2, or maybe I'm doing my own data center and I'm just going to fire up servers. Now what we end up with is, again, red and green, good and bad. True SaaS architectures. <laughs> True SaaS architectures introduce this concept of single instance multi-tenancy. Salesforce is one of the pioneers in this uh, category where you can take fundamentally those low-level app components, think your database, think your web services, think your UIs, and share them logically within the component. Don't replicate each one of those for each customer, but rather create some sort of sharing mechanism that allows the application to influence the segregation and isolation and get lots and lots and lots of customers on single instances of the applications or application components themselves. Huge density uh, boost there. Also, since the application isn't SaaS naive, it's purpose built for SaaS, you can also hook a lot of that SaaS tooling at a much lower level. When an application is sitting as a non-SaaS application in a cloud environment or on a server, you could bolt tools around the outside of the application. They're not deep within the application monitoring things like transactions and knowing how to charge for them. Keeping track of fine-grained tuning around provisioning, what can be turned on and off. Those things are, are just totally void in a non-SaaS architecture. The downside of this, and I, this is something you could ask Peter about later, is that it's extremely complicated. It requires a bench of deep expertise, very hard to do correctly. Uh, Salesforce.com is a venture-backed company, right? Or they were prior to going public and all that fun jazz. Spent a lot of money on R&D, and that continues to go on over time. I'm sure they have lots of developers that are always thinking about these hard architecture problems of how do we get this low-level resource sharing, how do we get the tooling integrated with the application software itself, and really turn that into a powerful business. On that side, the throw hardware at it scenario is we're going to solve it at the infrastructure layer. We're going to replicate everything. We don't get any of those benefits. We get the terrible cost of delivery profile and nothing good. Uh, and I shouldn't say that, actually. I mean, there's some scenarios where that's okay. You know, you have really big contracts, small customer base, and they want it hosted. You probably don't need this. But those are few and far in between in the software space. It's a cheap way out up front, but you pay dearly over the long term. This sort of non-SaaS SaaS architecture isn't going to cut it. So the next thing I hear when I talk to somebody and they start to understand the difference here is, well, just throw it on the cloud and it's solved. And this is some of the stuff that Peter talked about earlier. Depending on what you're looking at, if you're looking at Amazon EC2, by virtue of bundling your application and getting it on the cloud, it's not any better economically at this point. You're still replicating it. You just have a trusted partner in the cloud that can instantaneously on tap replicate that for you and fire up the resources whenever you need and tear them down whenever you need. God forbid a customer leaves, well, you shut off a VM on EC2. You don't have to figure out how to sell a salvaged box that's been sitting in your data center that's no longer being used. So totally wrong. So the next question becomes, how can I get that sort of profile, a Salesforce.com style profile where I have ultimate efficiency, a true SaaS architecture where the application has that sharing at a really low level, how can I get all the necessary tools around the application and in the application to manage my provisioning, to manage my metering, to manage my billing, all fundamental questions. And then in many cases, how do I leverage the skills I have? Um, we have customers, and I'll get into the details of more what we do, that are startups who have .NET developers and they don't know anything else, to software companies that have millions of lines of .NET code that they don't want to throw out, and it would be unwise for them to throw out. So how can I leverage this and get all of this 
without making a seven or eight figure investment in R&D or keeping a line item in my R&D budget that will constantly be there to manage my own SaaS stack and build out my own SaaS stack. Jeopardize my window of opportunity because I decide that I'm gonna build all this out and tack on nine to 10 months on my development cycle to build a shoddy SaaS system that really isn't gonna cut it anyway. And furthermore, how am I going to deal with the fact, get all this and not deal with the fact that I don't want to lose my focus on my competencies. If I'm in the healthcare software business, I write great healthcare software. I understand HIPAA, I know what my customers want. I shouldn't have to take on the burdens of figuring out how to become a SaaS stack developer. Uh, just like most software companies don't decide, you know what, great idea. We're gonna build healthcare software and we're gonna invent our own new DB. Typically a bad idea, right? You go out and you buy Oracle, you buy SQL Server, you download MySQL, then you focus on the stuff you know well, healthcare management software. SaaS is the same, it's a stack component. So what we do at Apprenda is we've developed a server technology named SaaS Grid. And the best way to describe SaaS Grid is an application server, both physically and conceptually. What that means is that we'll take a whole bunch of Windows servers, stitch them together into one big network. So it could be 10 servers, it could be 100, it could be 500. And that network creates a logical hosting layer for other applications to be deployed on top of. And what you end up with is a fine-tuned, specialized server technology that gives you all of those things in an inheritable fashion. So what SaaS Grid does is it lets you build your application using pretty traditional technologies, think.net. You're going to deploy that with a pretty traditional database, web services, UIs. And we fundamentally change the behavior of the applications. We transform the applications so that unbeknownst to the app itself, it's doing things like mixing data for potentially thousands of customers in one database instance, not a database per customer. The app code is issuing its queries, it's doing its thing, and it doesn't know that this is happening. So it's inherited this robust enterprise class SaaS architecture, doesn't have to go down the replication route of every time I sign up a new customer, I'm going to replicate the whole application stack. But they didn't have to go through the effort that Salesforce went through in terms of building this really complex beast of an architecture that gives you all that value. Without SaaS Grid, those applications still have to do that on their own. We have customers that went down this path right now and said, hey, we're gonna build this awesome SaaS offering with .NET. They get to about the first box and then they call. Okay, and when they call, they say, we tried it, we don't like it, can you help? Okay, they come and they say, can we license this and we're gonna build our app. So as a company, we were founded in 2006 and I mentioned that I have some war stories and I think it's kind of important to know this because this is a eat our own dog food type scenario. Uh, my co-founders and I worked on a variety of software as a service projects together and it spanned the range where it was software as a service, meaning replicate the stack and we were re really writing code that managed VM environments to writing true single instance multi-tenancy type situations when you look at it from the spectrum. And we visited all of these and really understand fundamentally how they were built. We started Apprenda originally to build help desk software. I come from that domain, I really know the domain really well. And we said, we're gonna build a SaaS help desk offering. About a month in, we said, geez, we don't wanna do all of this ourselves, start calling people and figure out that there's no good enablement technology that fundamentally solves these problems in a generic, unobtrusive fashion so you can use traditional industry hardened stacks but get all the benefit of that type of robust architecture. So the founding team is very much a patience turned doctors. And the whole goal was, can we become the engine for the cloud? We have cloud providers that have all this wonderful, great infrastructure, solves a ton of infrastructure problems, uh, but who's going to fundamentally solve those deep architecture problems and tooling problems that need to be solved if the space is really gonna move forward? So that's a refocus. And uh, to date, we've raised a little over $6 million in venture capital. We closed a $5 million round this past November with NEA and High Peaks Ventures. And uh, we've been focusing on this ever since. Uh, to date, you know, our uh, customer log role consists of people from all kinds of verticals. Uh, we have folks in learning management software, healthcare software, CRM. So it's purely and obviously a horizontal problem. And a technology like this has a horizontal solution capability. So it's coming in and solving this around uh, all these different verticals. Now we focus typically on software companies that are in the $5 million to $200 million revenue range. And as Peter mentioned, you know, there's the old code in the new cloud scenario. Uh, it's more old skill or old stack in the new cloud. When we look at this, we have people who are writing brand new, they're part of existing software companies that are $100 million a year. They're saying brand new product line or service line in this case, right? We want to be a service player. We're going to make this new thing over here. We have a development staff of 22 people that know SQL Server, that know .NET. How can we get there and not throw them out and figure out this whole scenario? So we come in and plug that gap. We have customers in our portfolio that are pure startups that simply said, Two guys in a garage, we know SaaS, we want to go out and build a SaaS offer, or sorry, we know .NET, we want to go out and build a SaaS offering, how can we do it? We license SaaS Grid, again, we're not a utility, we're not a hosting company or anything like that. What people do is that they license SaaS Grid based on the number of servers in that big server mesh we talked about. So if they're really successful and they have 80, 90, 200 servers in their grid, they pay us for that. If they have five, they pay us for that. So they can stretch that out and they can deploy it wherever they want. We have folks that are doing their own data centers here in the Northeast 
We have folks that are using Amazon's EC2 to deploy Sascrit on top of EC2 and get the benefit of a cloud infrastructure. So there's no sort of bias as to where this gets deployed so long as it's pretty native traditional Windows Server. And our customers, what we found to date in some of the case studies we've been producing that will be released soon uh, highlight this, is that there are savings across the board, both up front and kind of long term here. Typically speaking, you'll see anywhere between 40 or 60 percent, so I took the 50 percent mark here, reduction in upfront capital investment. So when they're saying we're going to become a SaaS player and this is what we need to invest to get there, take half of that and throw it out the window. You know, they're not, they're not paying that anymore. Um, when we're looking at the time to market pieces, those are pretty critical. They're saying, okay, we have this window of opportunity. We need to move now because our competitors are moving very quickly. We need to respond to the market. We shave another 50% off of that equation. And then ongoing, just like the database scenario, they don't go off and build a team to manage their own custom database that they built from scratch. They pay somebody like Oracle or Microsoft money or they download MySQL and get the expertise of an evolving component of their stack that they don't pay for as an R&D budget line item, right? They're not looking at this and saying, we have eight or nine developers on staff. They're going to keep up with the market and evolve the SaaS stack over time. They're not part of the equation anymore. So there's no more competency creep, no notion of them having to understand SaaS, at least fundamentally at the lowest levels. Instead, they focus on their business. And I, uh, a little bit of uh, kind of selfless uh, branding and pleasure here, but when we look at this, we had a CEO from one of our customers who's a market leader in their vertical. We'll be releasing a case study about who they are next month. Uh, and when I say market leader, like top in their category in Europe, and what they looked at is they said, we're a .NET shop, we need to move to the cloud. And once they went through vendor selection trying to figure out what's best for them, they said without Sascrit, this would have been not possible without spending a huge amount of time and money. They said, we have this money, we don't want to spend it, we'd rather put that in sales and marketing and get people to buy our stuff. The only feasible way to do it is to use Sascrit and they move forward with us and they built their entire SaaS strategy and technology model on top of this. So it's good to see this. You know, I, it feels good personally because I know I've solved somebody's problem that uh, I've been through before and I don't want to see other people go through it. But then to see it validated in the market this way is huge. For somebody to look at this and say our entire business strategy, our technical strategy is banked on this type of technology, you know we're doing something pretty special at that point. And our future. Uh, right now we want to continue the success story in the ISV market. There are so many software companies out there that are making the transition. And don't quote me on this, but I think the more, most recent number I saw was that 7% of software companies have either transitioned or will be this year. That means 93% aren't, right? So a huge, huge chunk of the software business, and I'm not doom and gloom where all 93% are going to go out of business because of the 7%. That's not going to happen. Some chunk will, clearly, maybe 10, 15, 20%, what have you. But those 93% have to say to themselves, all right, when are we making the move and how? And that's what I see often. I haven't met a CEO or CTO that hasn't said we're not moving to SaaS. They all say we are. It's a question of when. So this market is very critical to us. We want to catalyze that. We want to take people out of that 93% bucket, move them to the 7% bucket, because now it's feasible due to our technology. Next is you know, looking at the enterprise. Uh, it's another interesting discussion. I think anybody in the cloud talks about the enterprise. Fundamentally, what I found is nobody really understands why they should be talking about the enterprise. I worked at Morgan Stanley for a little while, and one thing I could tell you is that we would write an application for one business unit, and a little while later, about 70 business units wanted that application because it was horizontally applicable. And you know what they did? They stood up a VM or a box for each business unit. Sound familiar? It's the same way that people build SaaS models when they're not thinking about true SaaS architectures. So the idea that you can solve with this same type of SaaS tuned architecture, the delivery problems within the enterprise is very intriguing. And I think it's where we'll see both the space evolve and Apprenda evolve. And last is keep a watch on this model. You know, there was never a point in time where somebody looked at this and, well, there were some people that said the desktop is the be all end all delivery model. Clearly wasn't. SaaS, I don't think will be. Cloud will continue to evolve. 10 years from now, I'd be shocked if it's identical to what we see right now. And to stay in tune with this and change it at a level where the customers vicariously get that change is huge. We want to keep current because then our customers keep current. So the more we can do that, the better off we are. And I think that covers it. I don't know if there's time for questions, but sure. yeah. Any questions from anybody in the crowd? Yes. Why did you decide to leave with Windows and .NET and the similar in the Unix space? Yep. So uh, I come from a Unix, uh, actually, OpenBSD and Java background, right? So now I'm in the .NET space. Um, there was one logical approach here. What we started looking at is trending. We started finding out that a lot of the .NET developers and more .NET shops were looking at the cloud a little more seriously when it came to building software as a service businesses. So we saw that there was probably a better adoption curve there going on. Second, it's very homogenous. You know, when you're looking at Java, and this is me coming from the Java background again, it's splintered. Yeah, it's not write once, run anywhere. It doesn't work. I've written stuff specifically for JBoss, then it didn't work on WebSphere, then I read it for WebSphere and it wouldn't work over here. That doesn't really happen in .NET. So the easiest way to look at this is there's a lot of homogeneity and the opportunities seem more uh, fresh for us. And the answer is, you know, I think we're, we always look at these other stacks, the old stacks, as sub-stacks. I think Peter's right in that the stack is evolving up, right? 
And we're higher up on the stack abstraction at this point. So we'd like to look at things in the future and say, hey, maybe it's time to support Java. Maybe it's time to support PHP. That's never out of the question. Any other questions? Great. Thank you. Last but not least, uh, we have a very exciting <clears throat> presenter from Boomi. And just a few words about Boomi. Uh, we've been also tracking Boomi for a good part of over the last year. And one of the interesting pain points, I mean, I don't want to steal too much of Bob's thunder, but if any of you have had issues of dealing with legacy data and various types of applications, whether they're on premise or whether they're in SaaS applications, you know, in the 90s, you had all these different type of middleware vendors who were dealing with custom professional services to kind of do these point-to-point -point data integrations. And I never in my wild dreams imagined that, you know, at this time we would have something like Boomi that really allows you, with no sort of real technical background, being able to do point-to-point -point applications so that you don't have to rip and replace, and you can ultimately get a lot more productivity and connect applications that are on the cloud with stuff that are SaaS applications. And just a little anecdote, uh, we actually, I had a good fortune of going to the Dreamforce conference, which was, I guess, last fall. And if any of you have gone there and you're interested in SaaS and the cloud, I highly recommend you go there. There were how many people there at that conference? 19,000. 19,000. And it just shows you like the day and night difference between New York and, and San Francisco and, and, the, and the Valley. And people are really, really passionate about cloud and SaaS. And it's an amazing, amazing uh, conference. And I, I, you know, one of the best uh, after parties was thrown by <laughs> by Bob, and I was lucky to at least be able to drop his name because it was it was that that's how excited people were about his application. And uh, so I don't want again I don't want to steal too much of his thunder. I'll turn it over to uh, turn to Bob. When um, Selmak asked me to to come and do this, I uh, of course said absolutely, we'd be very pleased to do it. And then found out I'd be presenting with Salesforce. Uh, which in our world is a little bit intimidating. They're the 800-pound gorilla in, in cloud computing. It would be a little bit like you presenting to Warren Buffett, I think. Not you were nothing. Exactly. <laughs> and so I did a little research. I said, what, what does Boomi and Salesforce have in common? And so uh, here, here you have it. So in, in 2007, if you, don't, if you don't know the Cody Award. We also won two this year. <laughs> If you're not familiar with the Cody Award, it is our industry's equivalent of like winning an Oscar. You know, they have a big ceremony, you go up and get your trophy, it's, it's very exciting actually. And uh, so Salesforce won in 2007 uh, for, for the CRM software, they won in 2008 for Force.com, and thankfully they didn't run in 2009, and, uh, and therefore we were able to slip in and, and, and win the Cody in 2009. Anyway, a little bit about uh, Boomi. Uh, we are actually one of those transformation companies uh, that uh, you, was just discussed. We were a traditional on-premise uh, integration software company started in 2000. Uh, again, we, we uh, started roughly the same time, a little, a little bit later. We, when we were building our business plan, we took a look at Salesforce.com, and we thought the whole 10 years, $1 billion was a bit too fast, and we would scale up a little, a little slower. Uh, but we are the industry's first and leading integration cloud. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what that is, but we build an integration platform completely in, in SaaS. Uh, we have 600 clients globally now. Uh, we're venture backed by First Mark Capital right here in New York City. They've been awesome partners. Uh, and we've got offices in Philadelphia, and, and I get to spend quite a bit of time actually out, out in San Francisco. We have offices out there as well. So I, I share this with you because we talk about integration. I think most people would accept this. Uh, it is one of the top three, if not, I think the number one impediment to SaaS and cloud adoption. And if you look at this survey, you can see, you know, it is when people are looking at adopting SaaS, the concerns that they have, integration always comes up in, in that discussion. This is how we use to solve it. And this is meant to be this, the, uh, this, the scared straight, uh, straight uh, poster. This is what, air quotes around e solve. exactly, yeah. This is what Peter and I used to do for a living, actually. We coded this stuff. Uh, I was with EDS for 20 years, and we made a fortune out of uh, going in and doing this kind of thing uh, for, for our customers. And so this is what we're trying to, to move away from. And this is what we moved to. In 2006, we had an idea. Uh, when everyone else was out building applications as SaaS, we said, what if we built an integration platform completely as SaaS? And uh, uh, that's what we did. We, we actually went out and tried uh, to get it funded back then. Everyone said, what are you talking about? Why would anyone want an integration platform as SaaS? 
So we actually bet the company. We, we took all of our resources and, and we took them off of the, uh, the product that we had and in a year built from the ground up a, a true SaaS platform. We didn't take our product, stick it in a data center, virtualize it, and call it SaaS. We built it from the ground up as a true software as a service application. And we're able to integrate any combination of SaaS applications, cloud services, PaaS platforms, any application built on force.com with on-premise applications um, without software, without appliances. It's all done from a web browser uh, and, uh, and a very, very, very uh, convenient way to integrate. So I put this slide together because it's interesting. I think we, we touched on this a little bit earlier. Um, it's no longer enough to just say you're SaaS. When we get into conversations and, and people say, well, what value to bring? And I say, well, there's no maintenance. You don't have anything to uh, install and maintain. It costs a heck of a lot less. You get to buy, buy, the, you know, buy the drink, pay for what you use. They say, yeah, 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 but what other benefits do, do, you, do you get? And I, you know, to me, it's always like sort of comparing a, a horse and a, and a Ferrari, you know? I mean, but they, but, you know, people that are the naysayers will say, well, they're both just modes of transportation, right? And I happen to like riding horses, and you see a lot more scenery that way, right? So that's the argument you get in. So I took, <laughs> so I took some time. I said, okay, well, what are the benefits that actually come from being built completely in SaaS? And it turns out there is a lot of really cool things that happen. First of all, we have one worldwide ubiquitous network. So we now have people all over the world building integrations, um, and we're processing now 130 million transactions a month. That's doubling every four to five months. So we've got this sort of ubiquitous network that covers, covers the world. Uh, anyone can connect anything anywhere using anyone. We have a system integrator in Australia doing projects for customers in the US using a resource center out of Kuala Lumpur all from our cloud. Everybody working remotely, nobody doing anything on premise. The community aspect, so people can build integration connectors or process maps or widgets and things like this and share them with everybody else in the community. We're marrying up integrators and uh, application partners together. Works out really, really good. So I won't go through all of these, but just to give you a feel for some of the really uh, benefits and advantages of being SaaS. Ease of use. Now, we actually had this in our product. I mean, drag and drop, uh, you know, visual integration, as we called it. We've now moved this to the cloud, so you still do things visually. There's no coding involved. Um, and uh, you know, this is something a system administrator can do, a Salesforce administrator can do, a system admin, that type of person, as long as you understand sort of the file structure and, and, uh, and database structure. Enterprise grade. And this is important. I think a lot of people. Uh, naysayers, competitors of SaaS will try to say, well, you know, it's uh, good for the lightweight stuff, but you really wouldn't want to use it for enterprise grade stuff. Uh, not the case. I mean, we have everything that uh, our enterprise, uh, uh, legacy enterprise competitors would have, things like infinite scalability, high availability, redundancy, failover, all those, all those types of things. Uh, we just uh, implement it in a, in a different way. And by the way, we've got, uh, we now have SOA support. We announced in the spring, I don't know how many of you in here uh, work in large enterprises, you've invested a ton in SOA. Uh, if you now want to extend that to include SaaS applications as well as your on-prem applications, you can do that without having to drill holes in your firewall, which is a really cool thing. Uh, we are distributed on the next slide. Um, this is a very important uh, aspect of our architecture. So there's no single point of failure. Once we build an integration, it gets put into a little runtime engine we call an Atom. Atoms can be distributed anywhere on premise. They can be hosted in our cloud, Salesforce's cloud, Amazon's cloud, an Apprenda cloud, it doesn't really matter. Um, and uh, you know, the real key here is it's like the internet. There's no single point of failure. Um, there's no single choke point. A lot of our competitors have chosen to put one copy of their application in the cloud, route all the traffic through one, you know, one place, <laughs> and do the transformation and then send it on its way. We don't think that's a model that's very scalable. In fact, we don't think it's a, a very uh, robust model at all. The community aspect. So we recognize when, when we wrote the business plan that at some point our competitors would catch up. They would announce and launch SaaS uh, uh, cloud versions of integration of some sort. And so in the fall of 2008, we opened our platform. So now if there's an application that we don't support, there's a free SDK. People can download it, build a connector, publish it, 
and that app will immediately talk to every other application that we support uh, in our network. Um, the, uh, the notion of public and private communities, you can keep that asset to yourself, you can publish it to the entire Boomi community. If you do publish it, uh, we actually give you an economic incentive to do so. There's a rev share every time that connector gets used. So it's kind of like open source, but we're sort of incenting people to, to do that. And just to talk again about some things that are unique to this model versus things you just cannot do with single tenant legacy integration products. Imagine this scenario, Salesforce changes their API and these guys are the absolute best in the market. But about four times a year they, they update their API. Most of the other guys change them about four times a week, a little harder to keep them up with them. But when they change their API, we change our connector one time, we publish that connector one time and everybody globally gets that update immediately uh, and everybody stays in lockstep with that, with that update. Contrast that with the legacy style, you would have to go to every instance of that integration product, find it and update it. You will never keep up. The one fundamental belief we have, the one thing that we, the mantra you know, with Boomi is that you cannot scale multi-tenant architecture with single instance integration. It will become the rate limiting factor. Taking another cue from the Salesforce uh, playbook, we also just launched the industry's first uh, trust site for a cloud integration platform. We now have a website, trust.boomi.com, that you can go to, look at 30 days of our history of uptime, reliability, performance. Uh, that's a very scary step, I can tell you. Uh, I, no stayed, I stayed awake uh, for a few nights leading up to that announcement, but I think it's the absolute right thing to do. And I can tell you that it has definitely driven uh, behavior changes with, within Boomi in terms of uh, obviously the uh, sensitivity to, uh, to our performance and uptime. All right, so the last two things I wanted to talk about uh, was the impact of this to the enterprise because you could argue that a lot of the traction that SaaS and particularly SaaS applications have had have been sort of in the SMB, you know, mid-market tiers as SaaS and cloud computing now really start to take root in the enterprise uh, it turns out that having a cloud integration platform is actually a pretty cool thing even for traditional on-premise integration. So even if you're not trying to integrate anything in the, in the cloud, uh, it turns out there's quite a lot of benefits of doing, uh, doing integration from the cloud. And the problem with traditional enterprise integration, traditional software products, is inside of the product, is or all the functions that you need to do for integration. So building, deploying, managing, as well as the execution. In reality, the only thing that needs to be distributed around the enterprise is the execution piece. But unfortunately, because when we were building single tenant software products, you had to copy everything. And so large enterprises end up running 10, 15, 20, 50 copies of these integration stacks around the enterprise. Well, what does that do? when you, it weakens governance, it weakens policy control, it weakens security. I mean, now that when you want to implement one sort of governance policy, just to take one example, you have to go to every instance of that software and, and make the update. Very, very hard to, to keep synchronized and, and keep together. Let's go to the next slide. So, turns out, using Boomi for on-premise integration is, is actually a very powerful thing because you centralize in one place the build and the deploy and the manage, and only the execution, the atom that I talked about earlier, gets distributed around the enterprise. So now you've centralized all of the security, the policy, the auditability, the reporting, the end-to-end -end visibility, all the problems that uh, arguably the integration industry has created for itself over the years, uh, you know, we've, we've greatly simplified. And I have a cool white paper coming out on that if you're into that subject. Uh, article just ran in ZDNet uh, this week, uh, take a look at it. But I think this is really very cool and sort of the next wave for where, for where Boomi will be heading. Uh, certainly the SMB and the market has been fun, but I think for all of us the real uh, payday is with, uh, with large enterprise. So that's it, the bottom line, uh, integration critical to cloud computing. I would argue as critical as virtualization, it's a fundamental building block. Uh, everybody knows cloud computing is set for explosive growth and we're the only pure play uh, in the space. And uh, that's why uh, Somac and I have so many interesting conversations about Boomi. Thank you. Um, are there any questions? Um, once your clients build this uh, 
the cloud-based configuration, what are they doing with the data? Are they dumping it into a warehouse? Are they building another application layer on top of it? You know, what, what are the results? Yeah, like sort of what are the, yeah, the use cases. So it turns out 70% of all of our use cases, just for uh, interest sake, something in the cloud to something on premise. Yeah. So only 30% right now is just cloud to cloud. The number one use case, no doubt a little bit because of the, the giant footprint that Salesforce has, is CRM to financial. So people want to do something, for example, like I've closed one an opportunity in Salesforce, I wanted to create a customer record in my financial system. That's the type of use case we see. Marketing automation, probably right on the heels of that. So I get a lead, I score it to a certain point, I want it to now create an opportunity in Salesforce. And from there it breaks up a little bit, but uh, HR talent management recruiting type stuff tends to be the next uh, set of use cases. In the back. Do you have any <clears throat> intercompany use cases? So integration between different companies or supply chain? So inter and intra. Uh, so inter, we support EDI um, in the cloud, which I didn't really talk about. It's not the sexiest topic on the planet, but certainly is very pragmatic. Uh, so we do support EDI, intercompany, and intra companies. So if you have multiple geographies that you want to run on the same instance, one of the very cool things, again, I didn't talk too much about it, you can build an integration process once in a master account, inherit it into the sub accounts, so the geographies, and when you want to maintain that integration process, you change it one time, and it gets inherited into all the geographies. Very, very cool, very efficient use of the of the technology. Here, I'm afraid I have a six-part question. <laughs> <laughs> six You're not with cast iron, are you? Just, I just want to check. <laughs> okay. Six issues or hurdles. That, that was an inside baseball joke. Cast iron just got bought by IBM. So. Oh. Okay. Um, the first question I have is: uh, traditional server-based enterprise apps are heavily customized. How do you? deliver customized applications, enterprise applications to enterprises via the cloud. Then the next five are from Channel Web, which just had an article. And you mentioned integration as one issue. In, it, in this article, it said that there's an extra level of integration required when you use the cloud. The next one is uh, big data headaches, that getting large amounts of data in and out of the cloud is almost impossible. And the article said the fastest way to transfer three or five terabytes is FedEx. <laughs> uh, <That's correct. laughs> 35 terabytes, I, I probably would agree with them. Um, yeah. Customers still want control and some don't want data to leave their premises. It's then it creates new silos that you end up with pockets of data that then need to be aggregated and integrated. And last but not least is regulation and legislation. There are data privacy laws, uh, there exist and laws and regulations vary by geography. So <laughs> I don't know what you can't. I, I will uh, I'll try to take them in the order that are. I'll be happy to take the last one. Okay. Good. Uh, so enterprise integration. You're absolutely right. In the old uh, paradigm, very hard to uh, sort of expose customizations that were done to the application. I think Boomi does about as good a job as we can do. We, we sort of layer on uh, that, that visual designer that you saw earlier. It works the same way whether you're reaching out to an on-premise app or whether you're reaching out to a SaaS application. So we've sort of simplified you know, how you interact with it. But a huge step forward with SaaS now because these guys can expose to us at design time uh, <coughs> custom fields, custom objects, we can bring that into the, des the integration design process. It's really new architecture. It, it, it really is, yeah, and it's, it's really If sad. apps are designed to be integrated, you will have much less um, pain and suffering later on. And you probably have similar stories, but we have customers who use two different products from the same vendor, mm -hmm. but integrate through us, oh. because that works better than using the very brittle binary level coupling tool that the vendor provided. It, it, absolutely. I mean, the one thing that we, we certainly give is sort of living, breathable, you know, breathing mm -hmm. integrations. Mm -hmm. In the old days, as soon as one app was customized, the hard-coded integration broke. Yeah. And we have the ability to, to make that more dynamic. It was a glass slip rift. If it fits perfectly, but the minute you know the minute the foot grows, it doesn't fit at all. And and these are much more loosely coupled. Absolutely. Designed Absolutely. for a loosely coupled model. Why don't you take the last question, and then maybe I can get the other ones outside. Yeah, the residency thing is incredibly important because um, we have three data centers, but that's only, that's still only three: two in the U.S. and one in Singapore. And if you're in the EU, um, you can get very nervous about this. Uh, the, in Canada, they have a charming office called the Privacy Commissioner, who regularly sends stinging memoranda to Parliament saying, um, guys, this treaty that you've signed us up for, uh, it only violates the Canadian Constitution in three places, um, so you're improving, but 
um, they're, and they're working on that problem. The critical epiphany that I think we would both say here is that you need to understand you don't make all or nothing choices. If you have data that's not allowed to leave the country, don't ship it out of the country. Keep that data local. Use a customer token, you know, customer ID number or something that has no sensitivity about it. Do all the cloud logic up here, and then say, and now these are the 100 customers we most need to talk to. Who? These 100 customer ID numbers. And then you only look up the sensitive stuff, like credit card numbers and other things, in your local database, because that's the only place you ever kept it. And this is how you can get cloud application efficiency without running afoul of this incredibly complex and volatile stew of regulation where the ink is not even dry on the pages and anyone who claims to have a complete grip on this is either lying or delusional. Or both. Because the, there's no case law. And when you look at SB 1386 in California, there's even a suspected breach of a database you're required to disclose it. You've seen the big public notifications. We may or may not have had a database exposure. Unless the database is encrypted, then you don't have to do that. No one else in this room has read every word of SB 1386 looking for a definition of the word encrypted. But I can tell you, it's not there. There's no federal information processing standard, no algorithm specification, no key strength specification. It's not there. So a Captain Midnight secret decoder ring would technically qualify, but case law will inevitably say, well, come on, we all know that's not what a prudent person would call encryption. And eventually we'll find out what the law means. But right now? In the courts, of course. Yeah, the courts will decide what the law means. And, and, and then multiply that by 80 or 90 for all the different jurisdictions that are industry specific, geography specific, you know, any number of different overlapping boundaries of, 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 of trust. So work with cloud providers who can afford and must, as a matter of staying in business, to have people on their staff who do nothing but try to track this. And then, by the way, you also get the other gravy that you clearly exercise due diligence. Mm -hmm. You clearly made a good faith effort of compliance because you were working with third parties instead of having your um, the guy who runs your um, your email system right. now become your chief compliance officer, so which is what a lot of people de facto have. Right. They have a chief compliance officer. It's the guy who runs the IT. So, anyway, so, yeah. so, so, so one more. The one guy in the red sweater had his hand up long, no, long sure. ago. Yeah. Last question. Yeah. This seems to be the uh, technology or the distributed network competing. The wireless speakers uh, exclusive or focus is on enterprise, selling to enterprise. What is the impact of the, all this kind of technology to the smaller uh, startup entrepreneur company uh, uh, benefits? Could you two, th two thirds of our customers roughly are not enterprise scale. We're roughly one third, one third, one third. Our, we have customers with five users. You, I don't know what your smallest is, yeah. whatever, but yeah. The, the small company. Who's benefit? absolutely can benefit from this because the small company now can use the kind of tools that previously were only offered at an enterprise scale and where and if you and you didn't want to install an enterprise grade infrastructure to run your five person company so when i'm in places like india and hong kong the entrepreneurs are over this you know, like crazy the up the uptake rate for these technologies in asia pacific is four to five times the global average uptake rate because their their growth in their small and medium business sector is just fast. Do yeah. you, you do a lot of business in Asia Pacific? We actually right do. Yeah. Okay. That's well, right. he can share you know, his steps. The most uh, important thing is use that you is direct interface to the, the web and browser, and uh, you can really do not depending on a computer problem. That's right. Uh, we have had over 75 countries around the world use our software, try out the trial, and do integrations. 75 countries. Now, I don't know how many countries we have. I know we support 14 languages and you know, multiple currencies and time zones and things. And we're on every continent but Antarctica. Yeah, what is the uh, most popular product for the very smaller uh, uh, users uh, for cloud? Well, <laughs> most of our customers are still customer relationship management and Salesforce automation customers. The single most popular cloud application is probably email. Fair enough. You know, they just, you know, and they just ripped out 1.3 million users in New South Wales and Australia where the educational system was exchange-based moved them all over to Google to Gmail in two months without a hiccup. Thank you. Ray. That's the single largest adoption awesome. I know that went in one That's big awesome. bag. The other um, current paradigm, uh, uh, paradigmatic example in the U.S. is the city of Los Angeles where Novell lost to Google 
and the CIO of Los Angeles says that 27 other major metropolitan CIOs have been on the phone with her since then saying, how do you solve this, because I want to do this too. So, so we, I guess we have one last question, then we can have drinks and follow up. Keith, I guess. I don't mean to be the last question. Oh. Uh, um, it, it seems like a lot of the topics covered here we could have gone back to 2004 in an SIA software industry event and heard a lot of the same conversation. It seems like some of the new stuff is that, I mean, I know we developed SaaS applications back in 2002 to 2004. A lot of the infrastructure pain points that are companies emerging to help companies who want to build on top of the SaaS stack to emerge and, and make it really easy. Um, I guess my question is, I, and I'm specifically thinking of TIPCO and kind of their vision of the world. And I guess my question is, where is the SaaS infrastructure uh, in relation to very large companies that do it like tens to hundreds of millions of transactions, maybe even a second, who are trying to uh, find little bits of data from all these disparate silos of information and make sense of it. So real-time, huge amounts of data. I mean, this touches on your question about, you know, 40 terabytes of information needed to move around. So it's similar in the sense of tons of transactions, instantaneous access to that. Can kind of the current SaaS ecosystem handle those types of scenarios, which may not be applicable to like Meetup, you know, launching their yeah. Yeah. little company on top of the SaaS stack, but it has huge implications for like an Amex. In Why the same I... way that hardware companies like Intel looked to applications like home video editing to sell their expensive hardware. Companies like Oracle and SAP are looking to massive in-memory database mining to sell their old software, which I think of as immensely powerful telescopes looking straight at your rear view mirror. Mm -hmm. And what is the dawning realization in the marketplace is that almost all the really interesting data is not in your database. It's happening out there in your customer and partner ecosystems. And that incredible effort to mine everything that happened last month a little bit faster is now not as strategically interesting as mining what your customers are saying about you this morning. Yeah. And so I think that's really shifting the emphasis toward connectivity and real-time systems instead of massive data mining systems. Will there always be on-premise data centers? Yes, because there are some things companies do where small performance advantages are major competitive benefits. If you are running a stock exchange, a 3% edge in trade execution time is meaningful, and you will build expensive proprietary systems to achieve that small edge. It's not a meaningful edge in opening an email, yeah. and so you will not find. And so you will you will you will cloud that, uh, and that's where I feel the the decisions are going to be made. They're going to be made on economics. I think I'd add something critical to this. You know, the one thing I hear a lot is cloud, and it's always referred to uh, just the general kind of cloud concept of cloud. If you separate cloud technology from cloud itself, the applicability of cloud technologies that were developed in support of huge massive networks like what Salesforce has or what Microsoft has, applies within the data center that the enterprise has. So if you think about our technology, for example, the reason we have a grid in our name is we focus quite a bit on how do we stitch together tons and tons of servers in these really big scalable networks that have one goal in life, supporting applications that are living on top of it. So I think when you look at the scale properties that cloud introduced when it came to the R&D side of things and what people had to solve from a challenge point of view, this whole new kind of breed of uh, approaches to architecture has cropped up. Then middleware crops up to solve that abstractly, and then the enterprise can benefit from it. So uh, I think it was the COO of Morgan Stanley at the time, this was maybe a few months back, and mentioned something to the effect of, well, we're not interested in the cloud as the cloud itself, but we like the technologies that are coming out of it. You know, internal applicability of those really robust architectures. So I think at a bare minimum, the fact that the cloud has created these mass scale scenarios for web scale purposes has created middleware and technologies that are applicable to solve a lot of those challenges that you just talked about earlier. Um, and then the second piece is the fact that you know there are, as Peter pointed out, many scenarios where it just won't happen. You know, they're not going to move it to the cloud for a variety of reasons. Right now, they might be trivial and psychological. Later, they'll probably be more practical because the psychological ones will go away. So I think those two things will drive those, those types of complex problems, cloud applicability within the enterprise as a technology as opposed to 
outsourced or outside. I, I did a demographic analysis and figured out that all material objection to the cloud would be gone by around Christmas Day of 2020, just based on the age of the people. <laughs> <laughs> but to, to adopt Sinclair's color coding convention, the words that should be read whenever they appear on your charts are can't and or. If someone says, well, the cloud can't be secure, I'm sorry, that's intellectual laziness. It can be secure. The question is, is it cost effective to make it as secure as you need it to be for what you want to do? Well, that's a much more difficult question to answer than, is it secure? You can say, well, not, not enough. I'm sorry. You know, go, go do your homework. Yeah, Find out how secure problem. it has to be. Yeah. And the other word that doesn't belong is or. Because you don't have to make mutually exclusive choices. Yeah. I can use my .NET skills and I can use my force.com skills, and I can use third-party services. And if I'm smart, I am finding optimal combinations of those things instead of being lazy and picking the one least unsatisfactory one and now saying I have a classroom. Great. Well, I want to thank, I don't want to cut you guys off, but we can continue the discussion outside. Thank you so much. Peter, pleasure. Glad to meet you.